Hello, my good friends. Mike Shreve here, founder and head troublemaker of the No Pants Project. You are listening to episode 26 of the No Pants Show. Today, we're going to be talking about how to overcome shiny object syndrome once and for all. Another good title for this would be why internal work will beat external strategy any day of the week. So before we get going, I need to remind you of a core principle of the No Pants Project and also just a core principle that's worth making part of your daily life, at least the understanding of it. It's called the Kelly and Connor Emotional Cycle of Change. Two very smart scientists measured the emotional cycle that any given person goes through when they are trying something new for the first time. I'll give you the very brief version. I recommend you go research it online. There's plenty of information about it. It goes like this. When you start something new, in the very beginning, you are optimistic, but uninformed. So it's called uninformed optimism, which means you look at a new way to get clients. You look at a new way to a new uh, type of offer, you look at a new way to sell people, you look at a new tactic, a new strategy, a new thing that you can do to improve your business, but you don't really know enough about it to know all the bad stuff that it contains because nothing is perfect but from the outside you're uninformed and so you're optimistic you think this is the thing that's going to make the difference this is the thing that's going to make me rich and famous this one little tweak this one little strategy if i just wiggle this thing a little bit that's the thing that's going to make me rich and famous and so the entire basically how to make money online how to market yourself industry is contingent upon people continuing to behave like this, which is to say, everybody always comes out with the, here's the new, here's the better, here's the improved, here's the et cetera, and et cetera. And that's why they stay in business. If people didn't have uninformed optimism, they wouldn't stay in business. All those Lamborghini driving mansion rent and brosifs, their entire income is dependent on their ability to tell you something that you don't know is the next best thing. Now the problem is you buy that thing, you try that thing, you look for a new tactic, you look for a new strategy, you think, ah, I finally figured out what the problem is. And so you buy it, you do it, you try it, you go for it, and then what happens? You become informed. You realize it wasn't as easy as it seems. You realize maybe this wasn't the answer. You realize that changing your email provider maybe wasn't the problem. You realize that, you know, uh, changing this thing and changing that thing in my funnel still isn't increasing our sales. It still isn't working. I'm still not getting clients. And you fall into what's called informed pessimism. Now, the bright, sunny, rose-filled, you know, lily-field, whatever fantasy world has sort of had a tinge of reality placed on it. And now you're looking around, you're thinking, this is horrible. This is not what I wanted it to be. And you feel a sense of disappointment. You feel a sense of letdown. Then you enter what Kelly and Connor call the Valley of Despair. The valley of despair is that moment where you feel a sense of hopelessness, you feel a sense of frustration, you feel a sense of, will this ever work for me? You look at the promise that you made in your mind of what, you know, when you were in uninformed optimism and you think to yourself, gosh, how did I go from there to here? Then you start saying, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with this process? Maybe it's not going to work. Maybe it's broken. Maybe nothing will ever work ever, no matter what I do. And you and your brain just starts to go. And you end up in this valley of despair. Now, the problem with the valley of despair, aside from it being a horrible place to stay and a horrible place to to try and build a business in, because when you're not optimistic, you don't take the necessary risk to grow your business. You tend to slip into depression, which makes it harder to do simple things and simple things are what builds your business. But the problem with the valley of despair is that everything looks better now because You're in the valley of despair. You're thinking, how do I get out of this mess? How do I get out of this problem? How do I start getting clients? How do I start doing this? And you start looking around. And 
you're looking around at other tactics, other methods, other strategies, other ways to other external ways to fix the problem. And what are you looking at those through the lens of uninformed optimism? In other words, you're looking at all of those different strategies, all those different tactics through the same exact lens that you purchased or started or bought into whatever it is that you're in now that got you into the valley of despair. Now, this is dangerous because everything seems better when you're uninformed and optimistic about it, regardless of whether the thing actually is better for you. This is when emotion takes over rather than logic. And again, I tell you, nine. I feel like I'm always saying this, but people don't buy based off logic, they buy based off of emotion. And, and when I mean buy, I don't just mean exchange money for services or products, but I mean buy into beliefs, buy into philosophies, buy into ideologies, buy into ideas. They don't do it logically, they do it emotionally. And so here you are in the Valley of Despair, completely feeling horrible about everything. Everything looks better because you're looking at it through the lens of uninformed optimism. And so what do you do? You jump to the next thing. And you think to yourself, yeah, this is going to be the thing that gets me out. I know it. This is the one external thing that I can do to switch my thing. And this is the answer. And here we go. And what happens? You buy it. You try it. You do it. And where do you go next? Informed pessimism back into the valley of despair. This is the cycle of shiny object. And the thing about it is this cycle of shiny object is not regulated just to business. This is a life cycle. This cycle can happen when you're in the middle of a creative work. Let's say you're making a painting, you're uninformed, you're optimistically uninformed about how hard it's going to be to create this painting. You start to make the painting two days in, three days in, two weeks in, whatever. You hit a hurdle and you think, gosh, this is going to be way harder than I thought it was. Maybe I'm not that good of a painter. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I shouldn't write this book. Maybe I shouldn't create this program. Maybe I shouldn't build this business. Any creative activity has this cycle. And you get to the Valley of Despair and they say, you know what? Maybe I don't want to write this book. Maybe I don't want to do this painting. Maybe I'm going to do a different one. And you start over and you start over and you start over and you start over. For those of you who struggle to finish things, this is the cycle that you're going through. The problem is this cycle is not a productive cycle. It can be an exhausting cycle. It's a cycle that can keep you up until three o'clock in the morning every single day trying to figure things out, trying to learn new things. It's a cycle that I promise will wear you out because you're putting in intense, really intense hours, not just how long the hours are, but also the fact that you're putting in hours which are really uh, energy draining type hours. So learning new things, it takes a lot of energy out of you, making new mistakes, messing up, etc. And then of course, the, this, the cycle, the emotional ups and downs that go through the cycle. So it's not a productive thing to be stuck in shiny object. It's like spinning your wheels. It's like a duck who may look calm on the top side, but on the bottom, its feet are flailing all about trying to push it through the water. So what Kelly and Connor have suggested is that there is something on the other side of the valley of despair. And it is called informed optimism. Informed optimism is when you persist through the valley of despair until you achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve, even if that achievement is simply a breakthrough that allows you to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So for example, you're writing this big novel, you're stuck in this one spot, you think I'm going to quit this novel, you're in the valley of despair. If you continue to work on the novel, even when it hurts, even when it sucks, even when it's annoying, when you're in the, in the middle of the painting and it's hard and you don't want to do it and I don't like this anymore and I've lost my, my feelings towards it and I don't feel as excited and manic and when you're in the middle of a business strategy and it's not working and you think this is it, it's all over, I don't know what to do. If you keep going and you keep persisting, what happens is on the other side, you develop that rare quality, which is informed optimism, which is to say, I know what I'm up against, but I'm also very optimistic that this is going to work. When you hit that, what we could call mind spot, 
When you hit that mind spot, that is when things start to change. That's when you get momentum. That's when connections that you couldn't make before you're starting to make. This is how you get to mastery. Mastery is not achieved by starting a bunch of stuff and never finishing it. The true mastery where things become easy for you in terms of your ability to create results happens only after you've gone through the valley of despair. Now, we've talked about this before on the podcast. What we haven't talked about, though, is how important the internal work is versus the external strategy. And I want to give you a couple of examples. Today's a Saturday podcast, so this one's going to be short. But I want to give you a couple examples here of what you can run into and the mistakes you can make if you aren't aware of how important working on yourself is versus working on your business. So let me give you an example here, a couple examples from our, um, just this past week. Let's say that you're in a situation where you need to make some sales. You need to close some clients. And let's say that you are frustrated with the quality of the people who are coming to you even though you may have done everything you can to get the best quality, you're in the valley of despair. So you're frustrated and feeling like, oh my gosh, this isn't going to work for me. This isn't, you know, I need best. And so what happens? What do you do? You go look for other sources of information. You go look for new tactics. You go look for new strategies. You go look for what's the external thing I can do to fix the problem that I have. The problem with that approach. The problem with that approach is if you implement a bunch of tactics or a bunch of strategies without doing the internal work first, it doesn't matter what the strategies do for you, you will still get the same results. So Jim Rohn taught me early on, work harder on yourself than you do on your business. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about if you have a sales problem, the answer isn't to spend five hours looking at new strategies and tactics and implementing and and building new funnels and et cetera. The answer in this case would be to spend that time developing belief, spend that time developing confidence, Spend that time developing assurance. Spend that time developing your vision. Spend that time making it so that when somebody gets on a call with you, they can feel your radiated confidence in what it is that you're trying to sell. So oftentimes, a lot of freelancers I work with, they get on the phone call, they do these discovery calls, they're about to close a client or they're trying to close a client and it doesn't go well. Maybe it doesn't go well a couple of times because let's be realistic, you're going to get told no nine times out of 10, especially when you're first starting. It takes time. The people who are really, really, really good at selling are the people who've been through the valley of despair. If you haven't been through it yet, it's unfair for you to think that you're going to be as good as they are. They've paid a pretty heavy price internally to be really, really good at what they do. So just prepare yourself. Understand that's part of the process. I'm going to go through the valley of despair. I just need to stay consistent and stay constant. To get out of the valley of despair, yes, persistence is important, but the way to accelerate through that phase is not an external tactic. It's the internal work that you do to overcome fear, overcome doubt, overcome procrastination, overcome excuse making, overcome your own resistance. The best asset to fix and tweak and work on in your business is not your funnel. It's not your emails. It's not your 
client getting prospects or process, the highest leverage thing you have in the highest leverage asset in your business that you have to work on is you. Imagine the difference. Okay. Same quality of person coming into your business for whatever reason. Okay. They have the same doubts, they have the same objections, they have the same processes, etc., etc. They have the same problems, they're coming into your business, they're getting on the discovery calls, and you're having a hard time closing them. Now, let's run two different scenarios, hopefully, to illustrate the point here. Scenario number one, you're fully confident in being able to overcome objections. You know what you're selling like the back of your hand. You believe that it will honestly, truly change these people's lives. And so when they have objections, it doesn't make you frantic. It doesn't frustrate you. It doesn't make you feel like you're on a def- in, in defense or anything like that. You're fully confident in the process of talking to a client. That's scenario one. Scenario two, you don't know what the product is. You don't really know how it changes people's lives. You're kind of, I don't know if I can overcome these wishy, these uh, objections you feel yourself a little bit wishy-washy does the client lead really matter at that point the answer is if you've been doing this long enough no it doesn't matter the quality of the lead if the salesperson isn't internally where they need to be this is the mistake that people make And it's an easy mistake to make because in their ear, they're being whispered, the easy path is a tactical one. They get emails in their inbox. They sign up for programs. And what are the programs telling? Oh, it's just a strategic issue. It's not. Because let's say that you improve the quality of the lead 10x. Let's say the lead comes in and they're so prepared and they're so ready and they're so on fire and they're warm and they've been following you for months and they know exactly what they want and they have money and et cetera, and et cetera. And then they have a question and you haven't developed yourself to be able to overcome objections with confidence. You haven't developed yourself to be able to sit in assurance that you can help someone or that you want to help someone or even that you're willing to help someone. And that one question could lose the sale. Not because of the the quality of the lead, not because of the tactics or the strategy or the funnel or the etc. It's because of the internal work that the person who's trying to sell hasn't done. Let me give you another example. The internal work, some of the internal work that you have to do is empathy. So let's say that you're building an email list. It's getting decent open rates and you're not getting any sales when you're sending emails. They're not booking calls. They're not et cetera, et cetera. And so then what, what do you do? You think, okay, well, I needed to get better leads. I need to get better open rates. I need to get better. 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 And so you start doing all these tactical things, better Facebook ads, better this, better that, better. Let me test this. Let me tweak that. Let me put this over here. Let me put that over here. And you think in your mind, I'm making progress, I'm making progress. Woo, my numbers are getting better, my numbers are getting better, my numbers are getting better. The problem is the numbers you're looking at are vanity metrics. Open rate doesn't matter. Number of emails doesn't matter. Uh, Cost per lead doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is cost per sale. Are people actually buying something from you? And unfortunately, the thing that causes someone to buy is you being empathetic and a belief in what you're selling. And there's not really too many programs that teach that element. We try our best in the No Pants Project to focus on that piece as much as we can. But the problem is that you could have the highest open rates in the world, but if you're sending emails that don't exude your belief in your product, that aren't written empathetically to the people who are receiving them, that aren't written in a way that makes someone want to buy, it doesn't matter what your cost per lead is. It doesn't matter what your open rates are. It doesn't matter what tactic or strategy or any... It's easy to get shiny object focused. It's easy 
to make the easy changes. Wow, look, we have a higher open rate. Wow, look at our lead quality is better. Wow, look at our our website's fancier. Wow, look at these things. Are, that's all easy stuff. There's nothing hard about doing those. What's hard is the internal stuff because it's the internal stuff that causes the sale. Can you stay focused enough on a single strategy or tactic that come no matter what may come, no matter what distractions, no matter what failures, no matter what ups and downs, can you maintain focus on the one task you have at hand so that you can begin through that extreme focus to make the micro adjustments, the little internal things, the little phrasing, the little, it's the little stuff that takes you where you want to go, not big swooping changes. And you know this is true because how many big swooping changes have you done and where are you now? Are you where you want to be? How many times have you ever focused on something and focused on it so hard and focused on it for so long and focused on it no matter what happened, even when everything else seemed like a better idea, how long have you ever focused on that one thing and focused on the internal work to where it became part of who you were. Let me give you a couple of more examples here of this internal work being more important than tactical. In your mind, what will grow your business more? Staying up until four o'clock in the morning to learn a new tactic or going to sleep at 10 o'clock? I honestly want you to answer that for yourself and look at your past behaviors. Maybe you didn't stay up till four o'clock, but maybe you stayed up a little extra longer until you were a little bit tired. What is better, staying up late or going to sleep for your business? The answer is going to sleep. This is the weirdness of running a business. This is the unobvious stuff that people trying to sell you the next bright shiny object aren't going to tell you because again, their whole industry relies on you believing that staying up until four o'clock in the morning, hustling on some new thing is going to be the answer to what you're trying to achieve. We're on episode 26 of this podcast. Hasn't blown up yet. What do you think I should do? Keep doing the podcast or try something different? What do you think I should do? Learn to squelch the self-doubt? Learn to stop checking the analytics every 10 minutes, which is just a horrible biofeedback loop? Learn to... uh, Stop worrying about whether there's comments or stop worrying about... Or do you think I should go try something totally new and essentially abandon the past 26 days of effort and start all over again only 26 days from now to find the same exact results? Well, it requires internal work to not make that move. It requires the internal work to show up again on a Saturday when I don't want to, when I'd rather be with my kid to make this podcast, which may not do that well, which may not bring a client, which may not, and et cetera. And it, that, it takes internal work to maintain focus enough on a few simple things to be able to achieve results. I've said it many times throughout this podcast, I'm likely not going to see really any results until maybe episode 100. And the results that I'm going to be finding are going to be a result of the micro improvements, making the podcast a little bit better every day. Not huge, sweeping, swathing, starting over and recalibrating everything every 30 seconds. 
one of the things I do with my clients is I help them with this process when I'm working in my freelancing business. And it's always interesting to me because a lot of them want to do a webinar and they want to sell from that webinar and they think it only takes a week to test a webinar. It doesn't take a week. It takes at least 90 days, if not six months of repetitive testing, of repetitive tracking, of repetitive, etc. And that's because there's just so many different inputs. There's the autoresponder, there's the Facebook ads, there's the ad creatives themselves, there's the audiences you're targeting, there's a landing page, there's the follow-ups, there's the webinar itself, there's the offer itself. There's so many different inputs at play that it's not something you can just do in a week. And so part of what I have to help my clients, my freelancing clients do is focus long enough, put away the shiny objects until we can get this one thing working. I used to work in construction a while back, very briefly. Don't think I'm like some builder person. <laughs> As basically the uh, the lot monkey, and just did you know? This is like when I was 16 or 17 or something. One of the things that I've thought of often is if people, if if the average person who's trying to build an online business were to be successful enough to be able to hire a contractor to build their house, how upset they would be at the contractor if the contractor behaved like they do. Imagine you're going to build a house. You get these real fancy blueprints. You have a plan. Okay. It's your blueprints. You give it to the builder. The builder's got the plans. The builder's like, okay, this is going to be great. Love it. We can do this. Starts to build. Maybe it rains one day and Maybe while it's raining, because it's kind of hard, the builder has an idea, is distracted by an idea, and the builder thinks to themselves, you know what, let's actually cut this room out and add this other room on. And you're kind of like, well, I don't know about that. And he's like, no, 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 this is a better idea. So he adds another room. Now, because he added another room, it's going to put a delay in the process, and you have to basically start all over. Then let's say that the contractor just gets bored with building the house, wants to try something new, and all of a sudden your house is sitting there in the middle of nowhere, half finished. You're trying to be like, well, I need to live somewhere here really soon. And then the contractor comes back, tries again, but then it's a whole new plan that they've come up with. If a contractor built your house the way you are building your business, you would be, you would be quite upset. You need to be able to manage yourself like you would manage someone building your house because what you are creating as a business is at least, if not more important than where you live. Because your business is an asset that can, if you build it correctly, create for you long-term income, long-term wealth. It can keep you fed for many, many years to come. A house is just something you live in. You could live in a cave if you had to, but a business is real important. So you need to be the CEO of your business and manage your employees. It just so happens that your employees is just one and it's you. And you're trying to build this business and you can't build it like the example I just gave you before. Shiny object syndrome. Imagine the house built with shiny object syndrome. It would be a mess if it ever got completed. So slow and steady, but most important, understanding the Kelly and Connor emotional cycle of change and resisting the temptation for new, 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 and instead learning to accept and embrace familiar, sameness, Steadiness, forward progress, one step at a time in the general same direction. 
If you can do that, my dear friends, you can have nearly anything you want. Want to publish fiction? Great, you got to finish books first. You got to get rid of shiny object syndrome. Want to make lots of paintings? Great, you got to finish them first. You want to have a successful freelancing business? Great, you have to finish some things first. Shiny object syndrome will not help you to do that. So awareness, meditation is a good key. Journaling, very helpful. Especially if you review your journal entries to see, oh, dang it, I did it again. I jumped to a new idea. I jumped to a new thing again. Whatever you have to do, do it so that you can stop the cycle of jumping from valley of despair to uninformed optimism to valley of despair to uninformed optimism. I want for you to be optimistically informed. That, to me, is a functioning and productive human who knows what's going on and is optimistic about what's going on. We need more people like that. All right, my friends, this has been episode 26 of the No Pants Show. My name is Mike Shreve. I am the founder and head troublemaker of the No Pants Project. If you would like support and help and guidance from mentors and coaches who have gone through this process before and have built successful freelancing businesses, we have multiple coaches who have done six figures. Uh, We also have coaches who are, for example, stay-at-home moms who are doing several thousand dollars uh, per month, living the lifestyle. Uh, We have one coach who is uh, literally unplugs from the internet every once in a while, goes on these crazy extreme sport camping uh, athlete type things and still runs a very, very successful freelance business. So we have all types of answers to the valley of despair problem to create whatever business it is that you want to create. If you'd like to join us in that coaching and mentoring program, all you have to do is go to the nopantsproject.com. There's a video you'll watch plus 18 other case studies from students and clients of mine that I've helped to create their own freelancing business, helping them to apply some of the things that we've talked about today. And after the end of watching some of those or any of those, or you don't even have to watch them necessarily, but the info is all there, you can apply to have a call with one of my team members who will determine whether or not we could help you or whether you're a good fit for what it is that we do. And we could get you up and running inside of the program within just really a few hours if you wanted to introduce you to these coaches. Help you to get out of that shiny object syndrome. Focus on one simple path forward. One that you can master. And then to add other elements one at a time in a controlled and uh, profitable and forward moving manner, all the while getting the support and help from coaches to help you to maintain the resistance against shiny object so that you can get done what you want to achieve. Again, that's going to the nopantsproject.com. You can start that process, kick that process off. We love having new people in our program. We have at the moment seven coaches who help our students, which is a big reason why we have so many success stories. We'd love to have you in there. Otherwise, this has been episode 26, and I will see you tomorrow.